we'll welcome those of you who have joined us. I see uh, we're a total of 17 people right now. And you have tuned in to the uh, webinar on the federal renter, renter's credit discussion. We need to correct that. Um, and uh, this is a joint presentation by the California Housing Partnership and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities uh, of their uh, proposal, which they've developed over the last number of months with a wide range of stakeholder input. And you see in front of you the agenda for the day uh, for this uh, webinar. We're going to start just by making sure that everyone um, knows the logistics for the webinar. There is uh, a section for Q&A that we're going to be getting to later in the webinar, right about 10.35 or so. And we invite you, in fact, uh, request that you use the question feature in the webinar control panel. And uh, as we cover topics, please send your questions in to us so that we have a chance to preview them and uh, try to group them together and make sure we have a chance to respond to as many of them as possible. Um, we will be going through uh, first the proposal from the center. And uh, you see that uh, we have two presenters on that who I'll introduce in a moment. And then we'll be looking at a case study of how the renter's credit could be used in California in conjunction with tax credits. And we have questions and answers. And we'll be concluding with some next steps and how those of us in California can be more involved going forward with this proposal. So the um, anything else in logistics? Barbara, you want to add? Um, we're having a technical problem on this end, so you may have to run the slides. OK. Be happy to do that. And uh, with that, so just to touch on the goals that we have for the webinar, uh, hopefully you can all see these on your screen. And if you can't, please. Uh, say so by questions uh, and answers in the chat section. But we're going to run through uh, the political context. Barbara and Will are going to help us do that in Washington for tax reform. We're going to try to make sure we have a thorough understanding of the basics of the renter's credit proposal. And we are going to try to talk about some of the key issues in the proposal that we see from California uh, via questions and comments. And then we're going to talk about next steps and how to engage. So we are uh, doing this jointly with the center because uh, California Housing Partnership, which has worked okay. with many of you on this call over the last few years yeah. in trying to make our uh, make more sense, better sense of what's been happening in Washington with respect to our funding programs and policy innovation. Uh, we have found that the Center on Budget has really been the single best source of information on a wide variety of progr housing programs and funding levels. And uh, in particular, uh, Barbara Sard, who's going to be the uh, lead presenter today, I think uh, many of you know that in addition to being uh, director of the Center's housing policy program, uh, Barbara was uh, recently at the U.S. Department of Housing, where she was senior advisor to the secretary on a number of overlapping issues. And uh, prior to that, uh, she'd been at the center. Uh, and b before that, I think what makes Barbara a particularly uh, great partner for us out here is uh, she was a legal services attorney representing low-income tenants and a commissioner for a housing authority. Um, so Barbara has a terrific range of experience that enables her to see multiple perspectives on these issues. And I think that uh, when we go through the proposal, we'll see that those different perspectives are, are addressed in the proposal, which uh, I think makes it a particularly powerful tool. And Will Fisher, senior uh, policy analyst for the center, uh, has been also a very valuable colleague particularly helping us uh, in understanding our the housing voucher program and project-based voucher component of it here in California, um, and a lot of related issues. And Will's going to assist Barbara with some of the presentation as he has with putting together the proposal. What I want to comment on is just uh, it's been challenging from California to watch 
the funding cuts that we've seen over the last few years, and in fact, from a housing authority perspective in particular, for you know 20 years, really, uh, as the budget has become, budgets have become um, prorated and prorated down to the point where it's difficult to make ends meet. And it's been very frustrating in this fiscal climate to try to think of what we can do that's proactive, that could be positive and not just a defensive action. And we're at a critical time now with the uh, recent election behind us. Uh, we know that it is very likely that serious discussions on tax reform um, are ongoing now but will be, become front and center early next year. And uh, colleagues in Washington that I know some of the rest of you on this call speak to are pretty regularly liken this, this period to 1986 when the last serious attempt at tax reform was made. And uh, our predecessors, in fact some of our colleagues that we still work with, were prescient enough to have a proposal ready, a tax proposal ready, uh, that could be placed in the context of the 1986 Tax Reform Act that then created the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. If that proposal had not been ready, even though the chances for its passage might initially have seemed slim, we would not have the low-income housing tax credit today. So that's why the California Housing Partnership, and I know joined by many of you on this call, feel it's critical that we have a proposal that would advance our field, would add resources, um, and not just be in a defensive posture defending the existing low-income housing tax credit during this crucial period. And we're going to get to weigh the merits of this proposal today, but we believe that it is worthy of consideration as that proposal. And even if its uh, chances for inclusion are, are uh, not 100%, uh, uh, we think it's worth investing time in, and we hope you will too as we go through it. So without further ado, uh, Barbara, I'm going to um, turn to your slides. And um, unless you tell me you're ready to operate them, I'll, I'll have them on here on my screen. Well, OK, great. We'll hopefully recover in time for uh, Will to do his own. But um, can you go to the first slide? Matt, can you move it? Yeah. OK, great. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, so Matt has already uh, given you part of the context. Um, and uh, I just came, in fact, from a meeting with the housing branch at the Office of Management and Budget. And uh, this seems even more real, as they were saying you know, the administration is um, starting to really crank up on the details of their tax reform proposal for 2013. Um, so it does seem that there is going to be at least um, the topical opportunity uh, to get something new in the world of uh, a housing benefit. Um, but the and the need to do that is really I, I can't overstate um, the dismal prospects on the uh, side of the regular rental assistance programs that are funded through annual appropriations. Some of you may have listened to the webinar we did last Friday. Um, and you know, it's going to be, this slide was, <laughs> must have been written in a more optimistic moment when we said that it would be um, unlikely to get a significant increase in the number of families receiving rental assistance in the foreseeable future. Um, in fact, I think it will be um, something of a miracle if uh, we retain the number of families uh, receiving rental assistance um, within the next decade. So the need is great, and there's an opportunity. And I think that the, um, from a policy perspective, if you step back, I think the case that we lay at, laid out in the renter's credit paper um, is resonating. And I'm going to take you through kind of the highlights of that. But 
um, the idea that federal housing spending is so unbalanced and that this is a time and an opportunity when adding a tax credit for low-income renters as a complement to the existing uh, low-income housing tax credit and housing voucher programs and other rental assistance um, could achieve the, the dual goals of uh, better balance in housing policy and better balance in federal housing spending. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so th these are the highlights from our analysis. Um, first is that when you look at federal housing spending um, together the, on the tax side and on the um, uh, direct appropriation side, there's roughly $250 billion spent on housing in 2012, and nearly three quarters of that. Uh, is spent on home ownership, um, and we we show in the slide the the largest categories, and there are a bunch of small direct spending programs as well. But most of that is tax, um, and only one quarter of federal housing spending uh, goes for renters, including uh, the tax uh, side benefits like passive loss exception that do not have uh, any income targeting. Uh, and this is occurring uh, at a time when homeowners make up barely two-thirds of the population. So they're getting more than their share. Uh, go to the next slide, Max. Um, and to make the imbalance even greater, uh, if you look at the income of uh, the people getting benefits, um, you can see that federal housing spending mostly benefits higher income households. And for the uh, direct subsidies and tax expenditures for which we can get data on the income of the recipients, more than half of all housing assistance goes to households with incomes above $100,000. And next slide. Um, when you compare the average housing benefit um, for the highest income households, those with incomes of 200,000 or more, um, the imbalance is, is even more stark where the average benefit for the higher income households are, is more than four times the average benefit for the lower income households. And that's largely because um, a very high share of the households with incomes above 200,000 get um, federal housing benefits, whereas only a very small share of um, the households with incomes under 20 get federal housing benefits. Um, next. And so um, I needn't tell you all that uh, needs have been increasing. The, this slide shows data through 2009. Um, we've been looking at the American Housing Survey data that just came out for 2011, and there's going to be another um, significant increase uh, in families without housing assistance paying more than half their income for housing or living in substandard conditions, while the number of families receiving HUD rental assistance has been essentially flat. Um, maybe a small increase between 2009 and 2011, but essentially flat. So, um, and with the overall budget prospects, um, the gap between need and recipients of, of housing assistance will only likely get worse. And the chances of uh, providing housing assistance to more than the current one in four who are eligible uh, are very slim unless we come up with a new approach. So I'm going to turn it over to Will, uh, who will explain the basics of how the credit will work. Will, are you on the phone? Yes. Thanks, Barbara. So, Matt, you can you can make me a presenter, and I can do them uh, directly, or or you can continue scrolling through there. Um, but the the basic framework of what we're proposing is that um, 
Congress would, would authorize states to allocate a, a capped amount of um, a capped amount of, of, of renters' credits that the states would, would use to make housing affordable to low-income renters. Uh, families assisted with the credits would generally pay 30% uh, of their income for rent, and then either the owner of the property or where their mortgage lender would receive a credit in, in exchange. And if the cap, if the credit were capped at, at $5, billion, $5 billion per year, we estimate that that would be enough to help about 1.2 million families uh, afford housing. Well, one of the, the basic design decisions we made here is to focus on a, a capped allocation of credits to states like, like LIHTC rather than an entitlement credit like the Earned Income Housing Tax Credit that goes to everyone who's eligible. Um, if, if, there, if there were a, a, an entitlement credit that were similar to this, the, the cost would be very high. It would be about um, close to $50 billion, according to our estimates, which was more than, than we thought was feasible in the context of, of tax reform. You could also do a very shallow credit uh, for a cost similar to what we're talking about of around $5 billion, but then the benefits would have to be very low, under $100 per family per month, and, and that would be too low to help a lot of the, the poorest families to afford housing. Uh, another uh, basic of the design is that it's a credit that would be claimed by owners and lenders. Uh, we also looked at the alternative of a credit that would be claimed directly by low-income tenants uh, individually, but concluded that that would, wouldn't be workable for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, it seems important for a, a rental subsidy that it actually lower a family's rent each month. And there's no current model for the IRS providing a, a tax benefit to individuals on a monthly basis. And we would have gotten a lot of, of pushback if we had tried to propose that. Uh, an owner claim credit, by contrast, the owner can lower the rent each month and then claim the credit and receive it through reductions in their, their quarterly estimated taxes or, or other withholding. Also, a, a large portion of the population that we're, we're targeting uh, isn't required to file uh, taxes, or if they are, they don't have positive tax liability. So that would have meant that a, an individual credit would have had to be refundable, and that would have posed a, a lot of additional uh, political obstacles. The credit um, would be allocated to states based on a, a federal formula, and this could be done a number of different ways. One possibility would be to use a formula similar to the low-income housing tax credit where it's done on a uh, per capita basis with small state minimums. Uh, the, the problem with the LIHTC formula is that it, it doesn't do a good job of providing states like California that have especially uh, high housing needs with an adequate amount of credit. So we looked at a couple of alternative formulas that uh, target more a higher percentage of credits towards states with high needs by basing the formula, by including the, the share of uh, renters who face extreme uh, or high high uh, rental burdens and ca counting that in the formula. And in our paper, there's an appendix which shows how this plays out for all of the states, but just down at the bottom of the slide, it shows the, the numbers for California. And as you can see, it makes a big difference whether you use LIHTC versus one of these other more need-based uh, formulas. States would use credits, use their credit allocation uh, within federal uh, income eligibility and targeting rules. All the credits would need to go to families with income below the higher of 60% of the local median income or 200% uh, of the, the poverty line, whichever is higher. Um, and 75% of the benefits would need to go to, to families below 30% of median or 100% of the poverty line. And we. Um, Pick these, focus on these uh, thresholds as a way to balance the, the goal of providing most of the credits to the neediest families, but also giving states some uh, some leeway to go up the income scale a little bit. Uh, within these eligibility and targeting rules, states would have broad flexibility to to target credits on particular demographic groups or uh, neighborhoods, particular developments, in order to further whatever state priorities they want to focus their credit allocation on. Uh, mechanically, states state could distribute the credits in, in three different ways. One would be a project-based credit that would be for a particular uh, building or development and which would be allocated to the owner or developer. And this could include uh, multi-year allocations of credits to 
that could be used to, to rehabilitate or, or develop um, affordable housing. Um, and those could be made in combination with PyTech or separately. The owner of the development would, would claim the credit or or they could pass them through to a mortgage lender who would claim it in exchange for a, a reduction in, in mortgage payments for the owner. The second alternative is that states could just allocate the credit directly to, to lenders, um, in which case the, in this, this is meant as a way for the credit to be uh, to reach smaller rental properties where the owners might be less likely to, to apply for or claim a credit on their own. And then this, it would, an allocation would go to a lender who, who does a lot of lending to rental properties. They would enter into agreements with, with owners where the owners would commit to, uh, to renting a certain amount of units to eligible families that reduce rent and in exchange the, the lender would claim the credit. And then the final option is that it, it could just work like a tenant pay Section 8 voucher where the state would allocate credit to, to families. The family would get a credit certificate. They would use it to, to rent a unit in the private market. Neither the either the owner would claim the credit themselves or they could pass it through to their mortgage lender. Um, in all of these cases, so that it, it could be claimed by the owner of the development or by the, the lender in exchange for a mortgage payment reduction. Um, and in, each, in both those cases, it could be the benefit would, would go to the lender or the owner by reducing their quarterly tax payments or if it's an individual uh, by, by reducing other withholding. And the state would provide a form verifying the credit to the IRS and also to the, um, to the owner or lender at the end of the year. Oh, one important question with this, with when using a tax credit to provide uh, housing subsidies is, is how it would be used by, um, by nonprofits. And we see two main ways that, that this would work for, for project-based credits. Uh, one would be that it could be similar to LIHTC, where a nonprofit owner would receive an allocation of credits. They would um, enter into a partnership with a, a for-profit for investor, and they would retain the um, management and operation of the development, but the, the for-profit would claim the credit. And then the other alternative is that the nonprofit could pass the credit through to a, to a for-profit lender who would, would claim the credit in exchange for a reduction in mortgage payments. The amount of the credit itself would, would be uh, calculated based on the difference between the rent and 30% of the family's income. Uh, the states would have would have flexibility to determine whether utility costs would be covered by the credit or not. Uh, and to avoid having the credit cover excessive rent, it would be capped based on an objective local rent standard. Uh, what we propose for that is, is the HUD zip code level small area fair market rent, uh, which could be used to cap the credit. And if the, the FMR includes utility costs in addition to rent, so if the state opted to do the credit without covering utility costs, um, the, the cap would be reduced 85% of the, the, the fair market rent. The state would be, um, would be responsible for, for calculating the credits and for specifically determining the family's income. They could either do that themselves or they could contract out to another entity like a nonprofit or a, um, a local housing authority to do it or for larger properties they could, uh, they could delegate it to the owner of the property. Uh, this next slide shows an example of how the credit calculations would work, and this is for a sample family with a in monthly income of, of $1,500 and a, and a property with a market rent of, of $900. And in this example on the on left side, it uh, shows this, the, the cap based on the small area fair market rent is $850, so there's $50 in excess rent, and the family would be responsible for that themselves. Then the family would also pay an income-based rent of 30% of their $1,500 monthly income, and that would come to $450. So the total family rent payment would be uh, $500. So that would that would be a reduction of, of $400 below the the market rent, and that would be the basis for the credit determination. Of the maximum credit would be that $400. We're proposing also to give states the option to to set a credit percentage that's below 100% that would reduce the credit below that $400. And the reason for that is that, that owners would often get a kind of a double tax benefit from this. They would get the credit itself, but then also because the credit would replace taxable rental income with a, a non-taxable credit, they would reduce their income tax liability that way. 
Uh, so this, the right-hand side here shows an example where the state chooses to set the credit percentage at, at 70 percent, and so that reduces the credit on the $400 rent reduction to $280. And if the owner has a 35 percent marginal tax rate, they get a $140 reduction in their tax, tax uh, liability from that, so the total benefit comes up to, to $420, which is so a little bit above the $400 uh, rent reduction, but not a not by a large amount. This is this credit percentage would be totally at the discretion of states, and we anticipate that this right-hand example would apply more, and uh, where there would be a, a much lower credit percentage would apply more in cases where the, it's claimed by an investor or claimed by a, a bank, and other situations where it's a, a tenant-based credit or a credit, property-based credit that goes directly to, to smaller owners. Uh, states would be, we'd assume, be more likely to go with a simpler approach that would either have a higher percentage or just make the credit equal to the to the rent reduction, uh, since those owners wouldn't have as uh, high a marginal tax rate, or the state wouldn't wouldn't necessarily know what their tax rate is. Um, the, the states would be responsible for their own administrative uh, costs under this proposal. The, we didn't think it was feasible to propose a stream of uh, a stream of um, appropriations to cover administrative costs alongside the credit. We've tried to design the proposal to give states a lot of options to, to minimize their administrative costs if they choose to do so. So, for example, on inspections, we're proposing to leave that largely to states to determine how frequently to do inspections, whether they want to rely on inspections that are done through other, uh, other housing programs, and also whether they want to choose uh, to set their own quality standards instead of using federal standards. Um, and similarly, the, on income recertifications, we're, we're proposing to have a, a more flexible system than exists now in, in Section 8 or other federal rental assistance programs. So states could do uh, review families' incomes less frequently than every year, at least for families with fixed incomes like SSI or Social Security. And there would be no requirement for states to do uh, income reviews interim income reviews during the course of the year if the family's income changes. And so those things would, taken together, reduce administrative costs pretty far below what they are in, in federal rental assistance programs. One way that, that states could cover administrative costs would be similar to LIHTC. They could charge fees to owners or, or lenders that participate and then set the credit amounts uh, so that that makes sense, sense financially for the, for the owners and lenders. If state aren't able to cover the costs through through fees entirely. They could also use their own state general funds. Uh, one justification for this could be that the, the credit, if, depending on how it's used, could potentially reduce state costs in other areas. Um, and, and you could have, if, if you use the credit for elderly or people with disabilities who would otherwise be at risk of being in nursing homes, that might reduce Medicaid costs. You could also have similar effects in the homeless system or the child welfare system, and that would could serve to offset some or all of the, the state's administrative costs from the from the credit. Uh, another option is that is that they could could use home or CDBG funds to cover the administrative costs. Uh, this would require a statutory change to permit that to be done, but but we think it would be worthwhile just to give states the option if they, if they decide that that would be a, a worthwhile use of the funds uh, that they could do that. Um, and so with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Matt. Great. Thanks, Will. So I think I want to just pause to give people a chance to ask questions because uh, I haven't seen many coming in, and I want to make sure we're all um, able to engage because it's a lot of information that Will just presented. So does anyone have questions? If you do, please type them in in the question box, and um, we will do our best to respond. Let's just pause for a moment. Okay, I'm not seeing questions coming in yet, so I'm going to just continue to the next uh, the next section, which is uh, going to be looking at how the um, di the different ways that this credit can be used. That, that Will has just gone over. Of those, one of them is, uh, and perhaps the most difficult one, ironically, is how to use it together with a low-income housing tax credit. And um, in California, obviously, with our diminished resources 
and um, the remaining 4% uh, tax credit is pretty difficult uh, to use to, to really reach down and serve extremely low income households. The voucher program, the project based voucher program has been a powerful tool, but it is increasingly being curtailed by uh, congressional spending cuts and flat funding. So one way to think about this really broad tool that Will just described uh, and, and Barbara set up at the beginning is uh, that it, it is similar to a voucher in concept, um, except through the tax code. And like a voucher, it can be project-based, as Will described. And we all have experience here using project-based vouchers in combination with low-income housing tax credits. So these next few slides are going to walk us through what California could do uh, if we wanted to try to use this broad credit in conjunction with low-income housing tax credits. And again, the point here is not that this is the main way that the renter's credit would be used. Far from it. Each state would be able to uh, make its own decisions about how to deploy the credit, uh, and which is, I think, a key feature politically um, that makes us feel that this has some real uh, potential political chops on the Hill. Uh, but let's now look at what the credit would look like if uh, we tried to use it with low-income housing tax credits. So as Will said, there's several different allocation formulas, but just choosing the kind of midpoint, California would be receiving in the order of 100,000 units per year of renter's credit, uh, which is a significant uh, new resource, potentially, if we look at it at that level. The state, through presumably the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee, and I know Bill Paveo has been looking into this and, and in fact, may be on the call with us, um, would update its QAP to talk about how it would use the renter's credit in uh, the different ways that have been outlined. And uh, one of them could be in conjunction with low-income housing tax credits. Uh, the state would then publish a uh, notice of funding availability or equivalent talking about the number of renter credit units it was reserving for different types of uses, one of which could be in conjunction with low-income housing tax credit allocations. Owners and developers can then apply for a fixed amount of renter credit sufficient to cover 15 years for each extremely low income unit. And again, think, like, think about a project-based voucher contract that an owner receives, which has a minimum initial, uh, well, it has typically an initial term of 15 years. In this case, though, the credit, um, the renter credit, while there would be 15 years of it allocated, it would come in over a 10-year period, which is a key assumption. Um, but that's so that it dovetails with the low-income housing tax credit schedule of 10 years of credits to, to the um, investors. So how would we calculate this? Uh, one of the challenges is the renter's credit requires uh, a subsidy that fluctuates with the incomes of the uh, renters as they adjust annually. So to get around that and to be able to try to leverage the renter's credit for a capital project the way we do low-income housing tax credits with project-based vouchers, we are proposing that in this hypothetical example, we would assume that the average income for, setting the, for the purpose of setting the credit would be 20% of median for extremely low income units that would serve people up to 30% of median. And there is some data to support this that's about the average income for a housing choice voucher and Section 8 uh, beneficiaries in California. So it's not without some basis. But in making that assumption, the annual renter credit amount would be 100% of the net fair market rent after deduction for utility allowances, um, less the 20% uh, of median rent payment that would be assumed. Um, and that would be multiplied by 15 years and the credit amount would be fixed based on these above assumptions when it's allocated by the, by the tax credit allocating committee. 
The developer owners would then sell the renter credits packaged with tax credits to the same investor that's buying low-income housing tax credits. So let's take a look now at um, how this would work in a sample project. So let's assume a 4% non-competitive low-income housing tax credit structure and uh, 61 units of new construction, a mix of one to three bedrooms. Renter credit units would be limited to 25% uh, of the total. Um, and there, there are reasons to make this assumption. Um, some of them are the, the complexities of the program, but also a desire to spread extremely low income units across um, a, a number of properties instead of concentrating them in, in specific properties. And the remaining rents for this, the 75% of other units, uh, we've assumed for the purpose of this example would be serving households at 50% and 60% of median, as would be typical under the 4% program. So here's what the schedule, the rent schedule would look like um, for calculating the renter's credit for a, a typical development in Los Angeles, in the city of Los Angeles, actually Los Angeles County. Uh, you can see the mix of bedroom sizes and the number of units for each. The per unit monthly maximum rents are listed based on 100% of net fair market rent. And here, because it's a typical a sample project, we did not drill down to the small market fair market rents that Will referenced earlier. We are assuming countywide fair market rents as is currently uh, used in the conjunction with the tax credit rent setting program. Next would be the assumed amount of uh, tenant paid rent at 20% of median. The next column over to the right is the per unit monthly rent differential and uh, multiplied uh, by all the units we get to a total monthly rent differential uh, here and then an annual rent differential of about $200,000. Multiplying that by 15 years, the total renter's credit would be a little under $3 million, in this case, $2.992 million. So again, this is just showing a sample calculation. OK, so key, key assumptions in figuring out how much investors would be willing, hypothetically, to pay for this additional credit. Uh, you can see, again, that we're assuming that the credits would be delivered over 10 years even though it's based on a 15-year stream of, of uh, benefits to the renters. So we can match the tax credit delivery schedule. We've assumed credit pricing at uh, 90 cents on the dollar to get a target investment yield of about 8%. Uh, those of you uh, on the call who are in the business of structuring tax credit deals know that that's a lot higher than the current investor yield on low-income housing tax credits. But we wanted to be conservative and acknowledge that this would be a new credit, uh, and there's some perceived additional risks that would come with investing in a new credit like this. So we're being conservative and assuming that higher yield. The equity pay-in schedule would be uh, roughly comparable to a typical tax credit schedule. And um, so we'd get total equity contribution at 90 cents on the dollar of about 2.7 million, 2.692 million, uh, or about $180,000 per renter credit unit. So let's see how that uh, stacks up at the project level. While we're taking a new credit, we're also reducing the rents that would otherwise be paid uh, from a unit that would have been at 50 or 60 percent of median that's now uh, at and assume 20% of median occupancy. Um, so that is going to result in um, uh, a reduction in debt capacity. So at the bottom bullet here, from the prior page, we had a net capital. We had renter credits of 2.692 million, the renter credit equity. Um, using the assumptions on this page, we would then subtract the amount of reduction in debt that could be leveraged by this 4% tax credit property, about $1.5 million. So after accounting for the reduction in debt capacity, the net benefit to the project would be about $1.1 million. 
uh, as an example. And uh, again, for those of you who are uh, in the tax credit development world, you know that not every project that receives tax credits has debt, particularly supportive housing and housing for the homeless projects would uh, not necessarily have debt. So we're not addressing those scenarios. We're really looking at a, just a typical uh, vanilla uh, family or senior 4% uh, tax credit scenario. Moving to the next page, we then, uh, with the help of uh, others here in our office, uh, did a look, took a look at what the math would look like in several different areas of the state. So here you see in your screen uh, four regions, Los Angeles, Alameda, Fresno, San Francisco. The first line shows the annual amount of, of renter credit per unit that would be received using the assumptions we, we looked at in the prior pages. The next line shows the total amount of renter credit uh, over 15 years. Then taking a 90 cents on the dollar approach, you see the uh, gross credits the next slide shows the reduction debt capacity, which leaves us with a net financing benefit uh, that varies considerably by region. And finally, the per unit net benefit, that is once you've taken into consideration the loss of leveraged debt, what's the net benefit of the renter credit to these tax credit properties? And you can see that the net benefit varies dramatically by region. Why is that? It's because of the way the fair market rents uh, vary versus the underlying 20% of median rent. That's the biggest single factor. Uh, so, but it's substantial in all regions, from 77,000 a unit in Los Angeles to 58,000 in Alameda, 40,000 in Fresno, 125,000 in San Francisco. So we think that this uh, shows that the renter credit could be a significant tool in conjunction with the low income housing tax credit. There are lots of questions and on how to do this well. And some of you on the phone, I'm sure, have your own, which I hope you'll type in and send us. But here are a few that uh, we just wanted to flag. We've assumed 20% average area median income as the right point to size the credit so that it could be uh, allocated 15 years if it could be allocated up front in order to um, leverage other capital for a tax credit project. But that might not be the right assumption. Uh, it could be that to be more conservative, we'd rather assume a 15% of median, given that people in the ELI category could be earning less than 20%, will be earning less than 20%. So that's an open question. How will lenders size debt operating rents are based on actual tenant income? Uh, and that relates to the next bullet. If actual rents are below 20% of AMI, that is, if actual incomes are below that assumed average, how will the shortfall be covered? In, in working with uh, Will and Barbara, we came up with a couple of different ways of thinking about this. One is that there could be an extra reserve developed at the project level. A second, which we think would actually be a better solution, is that a reserve would be held back at a state level using perhaps up to 10% of the annual credits for this use uh, so that owners who had average incomes and therefore average tenant paid rents substantially less could apply for coverage from the state from that reserve um, to give the assurances needed to for operating feasibility as well as for lenders and investors. How, would rent, how and when would rents be determined um, is a question. Who will monitor compliance with the renter credit rules? Uh, actually, that's something that I'm going to ask Will and Barbara to comment on because I think it's a huge concern for the owner community as well as the lenders. And uh, should we limit the percentage of our renter credit units uh, of the total? Will and Barbara, do you want to comment on the issue of who would be doing the actual income uh, verifications and monitoring the correct rent calculations? Sure. Will, you want to go ahead? Sure. So the, the, the state would be, would be responsible for those things as the administrator, and they could, um, they, they would, they could um, do, do it themselves. Um, 
directly, or they could also contract it out to some other entity. So, for example, to uh, to a nonprofit uh, in the area, or to a um, a local housing authority, which because local housing authorities already administer the voucher program, they'd be equipped to deal with a lot of these issues around around rent determinations, um, and, and could do some of the, the compliance monitoring as well. But, but they could also delegate the, the actual rent determination to owners the same way that that's done by owners and some of the other project-based programs. Um, but then the monitoring and compliance would still stay with the, the state or the their um, whoever they contract out with. So let's for the moment imagine that the um, the income verification obligation as well as the correct tenant rent sizing obligation and perhaps an HQS inspection obligation is contracted from the state to local housing authorities who certainly have the experience and capacity to do those functions. I think that makes it a lot more, um, a lot less intimidating and a lot more understandable to uh, owners of tax credit properties and thinking about how this would work. Other questions that uh, we think need to be addressed, uh, obviously, what would the actual investor pricing look like? Um, we just estimated that. Uh, we talked about the possibility of a special operating reserve. Um, the decision, the, the assumption we've made that 15 years of credit would be compressed into 10 years to match the tax credit payments. Um, the need to have the reserve available in year one. Um, and the possibility that, in fact, uh, more credits could be awarded if it turns out that more net benefit is needed to get uh, to the project to get people to um, make use of this tool in some areas or all areas of the state. So, Will, Barbara, any other comments? I confess that I was not focusing. I was figuring out how to see the questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I can't see questions from my side, um, so I'm wondering if you all have seen questions come in. Yes, there are questions. Do you want to? So we why don't them? you? Yes, I think we should um, start those questions now. Okay. Um, so I think this is going to work most easily if I read them, but we can also unmute the person if I have this capability here. Um, so I, I think the first question is actually a really good place to start. Alice Chalcott asks, um, will starting this new credit um, impact the market for LIHTC credits, um, particularly since the credits would be going directly to lenders? So. Um, Alice, do you want to add anything, or you want me to? I've unmuted you, but I was going to start an answer to that. Um, so, our understanding um, from the diverse uh, groups of people we've talked to is that um, first, the lenders who might take the lender-based credits, either as a pass-through from property owners or on direct allocation from the state. Um, is a significantly broader group of people, uh, sorry, broader group of, of companies than now invest in the low-income housing tax credit, A. B, um, to the extent that there's overlap as, you know, you're looking at it for the, um, for particular LIHTC properties and attempting to have the same um, investor by renter's credits as well as LIHTC, um, I suppose it's going to vary on a case-by-case -case basis whether the lender is already at their uh, the max, uh, the maximum level that they're willing to um, commit to credits in terms of their projection of their tax liability or can absorb more. So I don't, I don't have a clear answer to that. That strikes me as, as very case-by-case. -case. Um, but to the extent that um, owners that are for-profit, unlike many of the folks on the call, um, take the credits themselves as developers without 
syndication without having to go through investors, your um, the potential um, sources of funds through the credit are expanded well beyond um, what current uh, LIHTC reaches. So, um, Will, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think I think that covers that. Alice, did that satisfy you? Maybe she's not listening. Um, okay. Um, and Barbara, just to yeah. add that you've been consulting all along with um, people very involved in the in the LIHTC program in Washington as you all develop this proposal uh, to try to minimize um, competition and threats of the new proposal to the existing well, one. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, a whole range of folks, the Enterprise, National Housing Trust, uh, and, and many others. Um, and I think one of the attractions is that there would be a um, expansion of the um, capital sources in the way this credit is designed, as opposed to if it were just a kind of piggyback on LIHTC, um, then it would be going after exactly the same sources of uh, capital. Right. I mean, even though we sp I spent some time talking about how it could be used with LIHTC, we're expecting that to be a relatively small portion of the credits and probably mostly in the high cost areas on the coast. Um, I think that's right. And even in a LIHTC deal, it seems to me that the modeling that you've done, Matt, which for which we are enormously appreciative, um, is only one approach. It, it, it takes the approach of the syndication of ownership for the nonprofit that you do through um, the LIHTC process and selling the renter's credits to the same investor that buys LIHTC. Another approach would be, if that investor is not the lender on the property, is that you have the syndicated investor who buys the low-income housing tax credit and the mortgage lender who agrees to take the renter's credit in return for a reduced mortgage. Um, I don't know whether you've given that thought, Matt, but I think that's another way of expanding uh, the pool of potential investors. I think that's right, and that's why the proposal is getting a lot of interest from some major lenders. Right. Um, so the next question, um, let me just see here. Um, oh, Alice is there. She just doesn't have a mic on her computer. I'm glad to know that. Okay, the next question comes from Christina um, and asks if there is a limit on the percentage of the renter's credit that could be used in any one project. Um, and so we actually would love to throw that question back at you all and hear what you have to say. Um, we have not proposed a, a federal a limitation in federal law, um, although we would be concerned, we have to say, to not have one. Um, given that this is a credit that predominantly goes to extremely low-income households, um, we would be concerned about having um, all or nearly all of the units in a large property have the credit. Um, I think our, the policy concerns are very similar to um, what you probably are aware of in the project-based voucher program where there are some exceptions, but the general rule is that no more than 25% of the units should have project-based rental assistance. Um, Christina, I think you are, oh, well, no, you're not going to hold on here. Um, oh, Christina, you're not on phone hookup, so you cannot talk. But if you want to say more about that, you can type it in. Um, the, um, the, 
Will, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I, I think. I mean, I think. Uh, well, yeah, the. I think that that's right. That the same kind of argument, or same kind of reasoning applies, and in, in the rarest credit, it applies with you know project-based vouchers today. And I think similarly, there might be, there was a limit. There could be exceptions for certain types of properties where it, um, there's a specially strong rationale for allowing more units, like things like uh, 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 elderly uh, development for elderly or, or people with disabilities, where some of the um, you could have a higher limit or, or potentially not not a limit, but then for other types of properties, there there could be a limit. Um, so Mike Walsh asked um, for property owners, when does the credit come uh, in terms of the timing and the concern about managing month to month operating expenses? Um, so Will, you want to go back over that issue? Yeah, so for a, a credit that's uh, kind of claimed on an ongoing basis by the owner themselves, it would be um, the, the owner would, would receive the credit through a reduction in their tax payments. And so the timing of it would, would depend on, on when those occur. But for, for many owners, that would mean uh, that it would be a reduction in, in their quarterly tax payments. So they would... They would um, each quarter get a reduction in their tax payments based on the credit. Um, if, it, if it was an individual who uh, had withholding for employment income, an individual owner, then they could they could have it reduce their their um, reduce their withholding amount, so it would come even more frequently than quarterly. But but we'd expect that the quarterly claiming would be uh, the norm. And then the, for developments that are using the LIHTC model and, and the sort of fifteen year time period and it would be a credit claimed by an investor, then the timing would work um, the way uh, as Matt was describing. There would be an acceleration so that the credit would come uh, to the investor over the first 10 years of the credit period instead of being, being spread out across the, the full period. All right. Um, next, I'm going to go to um, Amy Beinart's question. Uh, she asked, would it be possible for projects that don't carry debt to hold the renter credit equity in a capitalized rent subsidy source to be drawn over time? So um, Matt, do you want, isn't that essentially the model you were pricing or not? Do you mind just repeating that question, Barbara, because I don't have it in front of me. Sorry. Would it be possible for projects that don't carry debt to hold the renter credit equity in a capitalized rent subsidy source to be drawn over time? Um, the short answer is yes, I think so. Um, it just becomes less useful in terms of leveraging up front, uh, making projects pencil financially in the, at the beginning, which is where we're suffering the most. But in terms of an operating uh, subsidy, I, I suppose that, that is another way it could be used in addition to claiming the credit annually and or using a lender to, actually you can't talk about a lender in this case because there's no mortgage, but yes, that sounds like a reasonable idea. Right. Um, but the, uh, the alternative approach would be if, if that was really, if that was the purpose of it, if it wasn't being used for um, covering upfront development costs and it was being used for ongoing operating costs, uh, another alternative would would be to have investors make um, annual pay-ins uh, to the property instead of an upfront uh, investment at, at the beginning, um, and then you would get the operating uh, subsidy on a on an ongoing basis. But where, which of those, the upfront payment or the ongoing payment, which one made sense would depend partly on what what investors were were willing to do. Right. So to be clear, and that's a really good point, Will. That you're talking about the investors in the um, in the LIHTC credits um, and in the renter credits that rather than having it capitalized up front, they could pay, they could make a commitment up front that they're going to take the credits and pay annually. It doesn't have to have anything to do with mortgage. That's right. And let's just for a moment talk about what might become the most common scenario for using the credit, which does not have anything to do with the low-income housing tax credit, and that's owners of 
what were essentially market rate buildings for purchasers of market rate buildings who wish to make, say, a quarter of the units affordable using the renter credit, uh, which could either be claimed up front um, in the way that, that would be similar to what we talked about with the tax credit scenario, or they could be claimed uh, annually and underwritten as part of the acquisition or the, um, the long-term cash flow. And this has got the attention of, of a number of uh, developers who are looking at or already purchasing essentially market rate buildings and needing another source besides project-based vouchers to buy down the cost for a portion of the unit so that it's in fact a mixed income building. Right. Um, so the um Jennifer Laverell, who somehow has become a Californian, um, asked, how does the proposal protect against some of the abuses that occurred prior to the 1986 uh, Tax Reform Act associated with the syndication of operating losses? Um, Will, can you answer that? Um, well, the not not necessarily fully I have, but um, I mean I think the the there would be a, a limitation to how much this this could be um, the the um, losses would would be part of the the benefit that an investor would get in the credit, um, but it would also be kind of combined with the 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 credit itself. Um, right. I don't know so if that gets at the. So I, I think actually giving me a moment to think here. Um, I think it's really different because unlike um, even what goes on in LIHTC now where investors do get uh, depreciation uh, and tax mortgage benefit mortgage. through the operating losses, um, if it's a mortgage lender that's taking the credit, for example, um, they're not an owner of the property. Um, we think we can convince tax policy people that they still have enough of an ownership stake in the property um, because they have a secured interest that it would be okay to have them take credits without being explicit owners, but they're not going to be eligible to take the losses on the property. And, um, and in the case of a for-profit owner, um, their eligibility uh, to claim operating losses would be no different than it is today, and it wouldn't be syndicated. So I think we're cool on that. Um, and Gabriella asks, um, back to political questions, which I'm happy to get into if no one else has um, kind of mechanics questions. Keep, keep typing, folks, if you have more mechanics questions. We have time to come back to them. But um, uh, Gabriella asked whether we can talk about what arguments the opposition will be expected to make when this proposal is introduced in Congress. So that kind of skips ahead a bit. And so maybe we should talk about um, it presumes the proposal will be introduced in Congress. So um, Matt, are you OK with my going ahead on the agenda here? Um, sure. Yeah, unless there are other questions you want to take right now on, in the existing list. Uh, the the yeah. only other question is Mike Daly asks whether he can print the slides and agenda to share with other folks in the company. And um, you have them up on your website, right? Uh, I believe so. Um, <laughs> Marilyn's on mute, I think. But, um, but I think we have them through a link on our website. Right. The reminder email has the materials uh, so that everybody got them downloaded. And uh, if you email either me or Marilyn, we'll um, be happy to give you another set. So Barbara, uh, back to the question of, okay. is this going to become a proposal that's introduced in a, in a kind of typical fashion in Congress, or is this, would this come up in a, in a different way? So. Um, Honestly, we haven't made that decision yet. Um, it it might. We're going to make that decision based on um, what we think is 
um, strategically worthwhile. Um, and that is a lot going to depend on how the Senate Finance Committee is going to handle deliberations over tax reform. I mean, I think the important thing is that is to have a uh, the same as you would with a bill is to have a lead sponsor um, who's got who wants this proposal, um, and that's more likely to happen in the Senate than the House. Um, just because the, um, the House is controlled by the Republicans, um, although it's not impossible. Um, and, and we have had uh, positive conversations with Representative Becerra's staff. Um, and the other way it can be put forward is by the administration in its tax reform proposal. Um, and we are working um, pretty closely now, and, and um, we're doing a briefing for the Interagency Rental Housing Working Group in two weeks, um, and I think the, um, there's a lot of interest in this approach in the administration. So, so what about those arguments uh, by so opponents? So the question is, who would be opposed to it? Um, I got So there, there are two very different kinds of opposition at this point. I think that it is more in the rumbling stage than anything else, and I'm not sure um, whether these would ever rise to uh, the congressional level. So the first concern um, is expressed um, by many folks like you, probably, who are uh, very committed to retaining the current LIHTC program and are concerned that this proposal is a threat to LIHTC. Um, so it's not a, about opposing the proposal. It is about um, having priorities and fears. Um, and I actually don't think that one will come up in Congress particularly. Um, that is more an ex uh, the stakeholders concern. Um, the, the simple answer to that is that um, we are not proposing that this be in lieu of LIHTC. We keep saying that in order to succeed at um, getting a larger share of federal housing spending committed to low-income renters, we have to build on the existing programs, not substitute for them. If we substitute for them, we're not making a gain. Um, so we're very clear about that. And on balance, um, our sense is that down the line, if there is not a mechanism to provide deep affordability for a significant share of new LIHTC units as they are created, that is going to undermine support for the LIHTC program in the most serious way, because it will be seen as not um, making progress on the most serious housing problems. Barbara, if I could just put a quick frame on that. So the Furman Center report that came out recently, I believe, uh, said that there's evidence that roughly 40% of existing units are benefiting from layers of other subsidies to serve extremely low-income households. But the concern is, with the pressures on the federal budget, some of those resources we've been relying on to buy down the cost to ELI levels are disappearing. And certainly in California, we've experienced that. Uh, the, much of the state bond funding we used and some of the redevelopment, and all the redevelopment funding is now gone. So I would just echo that, saying we really do need a new tool to be able to uh, match tax credits, use tax credits to serve extremely low income households, um, as well as a tool to look beyond low income housing tax credits for mixed income properties uh, that wish to serve EOI households. And I think the other major argument um, we might hear in Congress, which is um, some variation on the theme of um, what are you doing proposing a new federal tax expenditure when we're trying to so-called broaden the base 
um, if you hear the mantra of lower the rates and broaden the base. And what broaden the base means is get rid of tax expenditures um, that reduce tax revenue. And of course, credits are tax expenditures. They're spending through the tax code. Um, so I would have been um, much more concerned about that argument if the election had gone differently. But um, I think that there is um, a commitment by the administration and by um, Democrats generally um, to maintaining a lot of the existing credits, particularly those that benefit low-income people. So um, I don't think it's going to be such a purist approach. Um, so I think there's still the problem of proposing anything new in a context where um, there, there's such a shortage of resources. But $5 billion in the context of the, HUD, of the HUD budget is a significant amount of money per year. $5 billion in the context of the federal tax code is um, a rounding error. And so it's a very different kind of playing field, I think. I, I, and I should say, I think the other issue is, is a legitimate one that um, we just have to have very good answers to, which is, oh, this sounds complex. So that isn't opposition as much as it's um, you know, a legitimate concern of policymakers. Um, now, we think we have good enough answers for um, those things. Everything that is new sounds complex. Try the long income housing tax credit program if you want to you know, think about complexity. So um, I think we, um, we have the responsibility to think through as much as we can uh, what, the implement, what the policy and implementation issues would be and um, resolve enough of them in uh, legislative text um, so that we make the program usable, predictable, um, but not hamstringing uh, state and local creativity. Right, and part of the complexity comes from trying to work with the tax code to create this rent subsidy, basically. Right. Uh, and, and just a reminder for all of us, why we're using the tax code is because, as Barbara started out by saying, there's very little prospect of any new spending through existing appropriations budget items. Um, and we're more likely looking at slimming down or, or elimination of programs still for an, another year or two at least. So this is really our best bet, is to find a way to use the tax code as our predecessors did more than 25 years ago. Um, and yes, it is going to be more complex than simply adding to the voucher program or putting money into the National Housing Trust funds would be. But politically, from all the conversations we've had, and, and the center's had far more of them than we've had, it seems like the, the only viable path to a new resource. Um, amen to that, in my view. Um, so I don't see other questions. Um, did you want to get back to the last part of the agenda, Matt? Yeah, I do. So t tell us what, uh, what you're looking for uh, as a next step, Barbara, in terms of I, I think you, you mentioned to me that uh, it might be the time to ask for organizations to start signing on in support of this in California and, and elsewhere. Uh, definitely. Uh, I think we're, we are at the stage where um, we hope we've addressed people's questions. We would um, be more than willing to address more. I, with Matt's help, the, the depth of the discussions in California have been terrific so far and have really been helpful. Um, but we understand 
of course, that people may have more questions as they chew it over internally, and, and we're more than happy to answer those. But I think um, certainly by um, within another month or so, we're going to be starting to ask organizations for endorsements. So I hope you can work your local processes um, towards that goal of uh, by early December being able to make commitments. Um, and then taking that up another level, um, many of you are active in cross-cutting kinds of organizations um, with affiliates in many states. And um, unfortunately, every state does not have the kind of organizations that California has uh, who have taken the initiative in exploring this proposal and bringing more people into the conversation. So um, kind of horizontal outreach um, to uh, your colleagues in other states about the proposal would be really helpful. And if, they, if there is interest in other states in uh, doing a similar kind of webinar, we would be delighted to do that. Um, and then the third piece, and I don't know whether this is particularly feasible in California, but um, just as this call was starting, I got a call from um, the Undersecretary for Housing for the state of Massachusetts who said that he had gotten the governor's approval to formally support the proposal. Um, and I think that getting support from governors is a key piece of what we are after. Um, so that's another uh, kind of target for California, I think. And that's definitely something that the California Housing Partnership can help with since we, we of course, we're, we have governor appointees, et cetera. But we would want to do it on the strength of uh, having other California organizations weigh in and express uh, support. So we, I know we have representatives from all four uh, regional nonprofit housing associations, or in fact many more than four, um, as well as California Housing Consortium. Um, so we're hoping that all of you will ask your associations to take positions on this. And I realize December is a bit of a tough month. Many associations don't actually meet to take policy positions. So Barbara, it may end up being January before uh, some of the associations can can take formal positions. Is that going to be too late? Uh, no. Um, this is, you know, until the chances are um, better than 50-50 that in January um, Washington will be somewhat hysterical by having gone over the fiscal cliff. Um, and they'll be in the final stages of trying to resolve that. So. Um, you know, we want to be in a strong place for when people are ready to pay attention, but attention may not happen until February. And what about our um, elected officials? Uh, you mentioned Javier Becerra from uh, Los Angeles, who uh, not only is he on the Ways and Means Committee, but now has uh, risen yet another notch in the House Democratic leadership. Mm -hmm. um, but we've also, uh, you know, read recently about uh, Nancy Pelosi's decision to remain uh, minority leader. Um, she has a historic track record of being involved in these issues. Um, and we have our senators who, just by dint of being senators, have some influence. What, what would be the right timing for those of us who want to be in support of this to have those, to make those contacts? Um. I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. I think we should get back to you rather than my just spinning it. Um, I, I, but let me give you a perspective around um, Pelosi in particular. One of the key um, elements that liberal Democrats in particular will be looking at in any tax reform deal is whether um, it improves on the progressivity of the tax code. In other words, whether it um, does no worse and hopefully does a better job than the current tax code in terms of um, raising more revenue from those with more money and redistributing um, revenue to some extent to those with the least money. So we see. Um, 
that assessment as a key uh, strategic piece of making the case for the renter's credit. Um, there, in Congress, there are not a whole lot of people who care about housing. There are a lot of people who care about the issue of how progressive is the tax code. And Pelosi is certainly up there uh, among the leaders who um, are really going to be assessing an overall package from the progressivity perspective. So having her here, you know, kind of early on, that this is one of the ways that um, the ultimate package could be made more progressive, I think, is important. Um, what the real timing for that is, again, that, that presumes that I know how this is all going to unfold, which I don't. Okay, that's a, that's a good <laughs> assessment, and uh, I guess the good news for us is we, we don't have to scramble within 30 or 60 days right. necessarily to, to do everything. We have a little more time, because I think lots of people on this call may want to take more time to read through the proposal and perhaps follow up with questions. Right. And I want to invite people to please email me uh, directly with your questions, um, as well as Barbara and Will. Um, so that we can just try to make sure that we're addressing major issues and concerns, knowing that a lot of this is going to be left to, uh, you know, the committee staff to write details and then states by design mm -hmm. to have the states right. be able to put finishing touches on this. That's right. And that's where I think we're very lucky in having uh, such a competent um, tax credit committee and staff uh, that we could rely on to help work through some of these details, uh, which would also have public input at that point. Right. So, Barbara, did you get any other questions that we should address? We do not. Um, and although the attendance has, um, we've only lost a few people, so people have paid attention, um, which is great. Um, and if if we hit the right button, um, we'll also be able to make a recording of um, this webinar available if you want that, Matt, Matt, so that you can make it available to more people. That would be great. I, and I am seeing a red light saying the session is being recorded, so hopefully we can right. do that. So I really want to thank Barbara, you and Will, and also Shania and Carolyn and everyone at the center who's uh, not only worked on the proposal but made yourselves available through uh, through this webinar and, and uh, taken the time to help get us up to speed out here. And um, also to my staff who worked on both preparing the analysis and uh, logistics here. And uh, with that, I think we'll bring the webinar to a close and thank everyone who's uh, tuned in and participating. And I look forward to talking with you more about it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.